Hi, everyone. Um, hope you're all doing well this morning. I'm Evangelia Bellis, and I'm going to talk to you about our work in engineering adipose tissue models. There we go. I have nothing to disclose. Um, so our lab was established in about 2016, so about seven, almost seven years ago now. And our focus is on engineering functional adipose tissue. And we do this by focusing on interactions the adipocytes or the fat cells have with their microenvironment. Um, we also look at responses to mechanical forces, so we were just um, hearing about how compression is helpful. That's something that we are interested in um, understanding a little bit more at the cellular level. Um, we also look at crosstalk with the vasculature and crosstalk with other tissues and cells. So I don't know that I need to explain to this audience why we need to engineer fat, but some of the reasons why we're interested in it is to be able to study metabolism, energy mobilization, to study diseases like obesity, sorry, obesity, diabetes, and lipedema, and to develop testing platforms for new therapeutics, and um, in a more translational way, to use it as a soft tissue filler or for soft tissue regeneration. So I like to start um, my talks with this adipose tissue simplified slide. And I, I like this little cartoon about how adipocytes think about their roles. Um, so they're, they think about storing fat, um, and at some point, they need to maybe stop thinking about storing fat. But we've evolved to be able to do that, right, to, to continue storing fat. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the difference between lean and obese adipose tissue in this slide. So in lean adipose tissue, the support cells, like the macrophages, the immune cells, um, they're quiescent. They're not really activated to do as much other than maintain the tissue. And this tissue is well vascularized, and that's to support um, metabolic and endocrine needs. By contrast, obese adipose tissue is where that excess nutrition is taken up by expanding adipocytes. This makes them hypertrophic or enlarged. And the tissue then becomes poorly vascularized, which leads to things like hypoxia, fibrosis, potentially some of these mechanosensitive responses, and metabolic dysfunction. And you can see the cartoon um, over here showing the differences between lean and um, obese adipose tissue. And in a histology image, you can see how different the two tissue types look. You can see healthy adipose tissue, the adipocytes are pretty um, uniform in their shape and size, and that really changes when they are um, obese. You see this darker color around these hypertrophic adipocytes. Those are immune cells and fibrosis. You can tell that the, the structure of the tissue is notably different. And when we create our models, we like to benchmark um, against human tissue. And so we can look at things like pericellular remodeling or fibrosis and the vascular remodeling when we create our models. So when I think about lipidemic tissue, um, or, or tissue that um, comes from patients with lipedema, there's, um, there's a lot of similarities and then there's some curious differences. Um, so we have what, I've, uh, what I showed in the previous slide up here in gray, but then if we think about lipedema, adipose tissue, it shares a lot of these characteristics where you see enlarged hypertrophic adipocytes, you see fibrosis, um, mostly in terms of interstitial collagen 1 and potentially some pericellular collagen. And then you also see this phenotype of hypoxia. And you can see here the differences between um, control adipose tissue and uh, adipose tissue with lipedema. So you can see, again, there's a very different um, microstructure to the tissue. So some other things that have come up in terms of these um, differences between the, the two tissue types, um, either lean or obese adipose tissue and lipedema, is that um, there's a mechanosensitive response um, that we don't quite understand. Um, and then there's also vascular dysfunction in uh, lipedema as well. And this might be secondary lymphatic dysfunction and um, also related to dilated blood and lymphatic vessels. So what's really interesting is that although there's all these um, 
comparable effects or comparable um, phenotypes within all of these tissues, obese and lipedema tissues, there isn't this um, metabolic dysfunction, which we usually tie to things like hypertrophy and fibrosis. So what's happening in lipedema that's different than in obesity that causes this lack of metabolic dysfunction while still sharing some of these uh, phenotypic similarities. Um, so we applied for Lipedema Foundation Collaborative Grant um, with our PhD students. Um, so you can see this is in collaboration with Jenny Munson at Virginia Tech. And we have a great team of students, um, including Jennifer Hamill and Mike Struss working on this. Um, but what I think is really great um, is that when we were at the Lipedema retreat, um, Lipedema Foundation retreat uh, a few months back, um, we were talking about the pipeline. How do we get more people interested in Lipedema research? And one of the ways that I think we can do that is by including undergrads, including more students early on in this um, research. And what's really great is that Carmel and Ariel are undergrads who are pre-med students. And so now they're going into medical school already armed with this knowledge, and they're already educating their peers about these diseases. And I just think that's really wonderful to see. Thank you. <clears throat> Also, Ariel's mother is a family medicine doctor, so she's already educated her mother on this because um, her mother actually had never heard of lipedema. Um, so I'm just I'm really proud of them. Um, so some of the things that we are um, trying to do with this grant is that we want to determine the parameters that govern the fluid flow and transport in these adipose tissues, um, both through in vitro modeling and ex vivo tissues. And we want to identify the contribution of vascularization to transport through these tissues. And then uh, attempt to find some therapeutic interventions um, that allow to, um, for us to alter the transport in the tissue. So one of the ways we want to achieve this is by developing something called a microphysiological system. And I like to call this fat on chip. So imagine like a little computer chip, but we're doing it with tissues um, uh, adipose tissues and vasculature. So um, we know that adipose tissue requires a close communication between the blood lymphatic, blood and lymphatic cells um, and adipocytes. And these together support lipid metabolism, endocrine function, and metabolic function, such as glucose uptake, which is already mentioned earlier today. Um, and what we're finding is that our simple 3D models of these co-cultures, which you can see here, that was um, published by Jennifer Hamill here, um, they were great for studying adipose uh, or adipocyte function, but beyond just characterizing the vessel network that you could see here, we couldn't really get a sense of vascular function. So what we wanted to do is create a platform where we can look at both vascular function and adipocyte function in the same platform and see maybe how they feed off of each other. Um, and so what we did is we created this fat on chip, which allows us to deliver um, soluble factors and, and do clinically relevant biomarker testing. We can look at extracellular matrix interactions, uh, mechanical cues. We can um, spatially organize the co-culture, and we can integrate it in a way that allows for multi-throughput um, assays to be able to um, look at drug and therapeutic testing capacity. Um, and so what that looks like is, is this sort of simplified cartoon where in the center reservoir we have our adipocytes, and through there is a blood vessel that runs through that chip. And you can see that it fits on a multi-well plate, so it allows us, for, allows us to do multi-throughput testing. Um, and so here you can see in green the adipocytes are surrounding this blood vessel. And if you look at a cross-section through this blood vessel, especially through this orthogonal view, you can see that it allows for um, blood flow to, to move through it. It's a nice open patent vessel. So that allows us to see you know, what is being trafficked in and out of that vessel. And we can measure, oops, I'm sorry. We can measure the vessel permeability that you can see here. So when we add blood flow to these channels, we see there's a decrease in permeability, just like there is in the body. And we can also see how adding this blood flow changes glucose uptake. So you can see that when we have that flow, glucose uptake is upregulated, or is uh, increased, sorry. And then we wanted to test a drug that we knew would 
would work on both of these um, on both of these cell types, both the vascular cells and the adipocytes. So we looked at something called forskolin. Forskolin, you can almost imagine as something like a fight or flight response. It, it sort of um, it, it will cause release of fatty acids from your um, from your adipocytes in order to you know prepare the body for um, energy consumption. And so. Um, what it also does to the vasculature, depending on what vessels we're talking about, it can either cause them to become more permeable or cause them to constrict. So it depends, it's a case by case um, situation there. So when we added that drug, what we saw is that there was no change to glucose uptake because we didn't expect to see that. And then we did see a change to lipolysis, which um, is here, which is the fatty acid release into that blood vessel. So we see the drug acting as we expect and then we also see a further decrease in vessel permeability. So now we're able to measure both adipocyte or fat cell function and vascular function on this little chip. And what, we're, what we hope to continue to do is to take, oops, I'm sorry, patient cells um, and put them into this chip and see how those specific patient cells are gonna respond to these drug treatments. Um, and also continue to develop these, um, these chips in order to have predictive outcomes for patients, um, including patients with lipedema. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to go in detail in terms of the preliminary findings listed here, but where we hope to go for our next steps is, um, or where we are going, sorry, we don't hope to go, we're going here now. Um, we're exploring lymphatic function in response to both um, obese and lipedema cues, and we're looking at things like glucose uptake, lipid trafficking, and transport through the tissue. And one of the things that we hope to do in the future is start to involve other cell types, such as immune cells, which had come up earlier today, and also neurons, which allow for the pain signaling. Um, so we have some, we've been starting a little bit and trying to get those neurons into this platform as well. And then we hope that all of this will allow us to eventually be able to detect um, clinically relevant biomarkers that then we can apply to a translational sense in, in the clinic. Okay, so I'm gonna talk really quickly through this one um, other example of a, a platform that we have that we are using for, um, for this uh, lipedema research, and it is what happens when the cells are exposed to hypoxia. So in a previous study, we found that if we expose our 3D engineered models to hypoxia, we see that um, we get an increase in, um, sorry, a, a decrease in adipocyte maturation. We have smaller and fewer lipid droplets within those um, cells. We have a downregulation of key adipocyte um, genes and upregulation of leptin. Um, and then we also see those increased fibronectin bundling, which is a pro-fibrotic um, phenotype. So we're seeing that hypoxia is leading to fibrosis, which is limiting adipocyte maturation. And we were able to find that this is connected to something called alpha smooth muscle actin within the cells. So what this, um, what this does is basically tells the cell that they're under a lot of cytoskeletal tension. They're feeling a lot of mechanical tension, and so that causes them to respond differently, and so they respond using this um, feature called MKL1. So this MKL1 is a molecular marker that, or transcriptional marker that we can now look at that ties to hypoxia in these cells. And when we reduce that cytoskeletal tension or we try to trick those cells into thinking they're not in this environment anymore, we return to a more normal phenotype for those cells. So we're tricking the cells into thinking they're not experiencing that tension that was generated by this hypoxia and fibrotic phenotype. Um, and so now we are trying to do this in comparing female to male um, cells. And what we see that hypoxia decreases adipocyte cells, uh, adipocyte size in cells from both um, sexes, but is more prominently um, decreased in cells from female patients. And we can also see that lipid droplet size is, is um, very much decreased in uh, patients, in cells from uh, patients that are female and exposed to hypoxia. And then we also saw that this affects how fatty acids are trafficked through the tissue. So if we apply um, oleic acid, which is a fatty, uh, fatty acid, and we see what, um, how it moves through the tissue, we can see that 
um, more of the oleic acid is taken up by male patients, uh, male cells, and um, oleic acid transport is enhanced in hypoxic conditions. So the way those lipids are sort of trafficked through um, is different in these um, groups. And we are now using this information to build out our um, ex vivo and in vitro um, MRI imaging. This is done um, at Virginia Tech with our collaborators. So we're using, this is on um, adipose tissue uh, that we can track how um, these cells, or these tissues uh, have different patterns of diffusivity, diffusivity, sorry, flow and direction of flow. Um, and so in the, uh, interest of time, I'll skip that slide and thank our team um, and our funders for, for supporting us. Thank you.